Chamonix, France, 1645. Charles Auguste de Sala, Bishop of Geneva, stands before the demon-possessed titan which has attacked the village. He raises his arms in the rites of exorcism, calling on heaven to deliver the village from lightning, tempest, earthquake, and plague. Deliver us! Repeat the 300 villagers. Then he casts holy water on the surface of the monster before him, only for it to freeze. For this fiendish menace snaking down the valley is in fact a glacier. It advances the distance of a musket shot each day, ruining cropland and threatening homes. The villagers, furious at government in action, are refusing to pay their taxes until something is done. De Sala concludes his rights, and whether through divine action or coincidence, it seems to work. The glacier retreats over the next several years, leaving in its wake barren damaged cropland, scoured clean not by demons, but by the Little Ice Age. Want to watch the next episode of our Little Ice Age series immediately after watching this one a full week early? Well, with Nebula first, you totally can. Learn how after the episode. The Exorcism at Chamonix sounds like an outlier, one of those weird pieces of trivia from list articles, right? But it wasn't a one-off. In fact, clergy blessing or even exercising glaciers in the Swiss Alps became a trend during the 17th century. It was done at least once more in the 1640s, at another village in 1653, and twice on the same glacier in 1664 and 1669. Several settlements in the area even formed pacts with God that if the villagers lived righteous lives, he would then cause the glaciers to recede. And in a strange way, they weren't wrong to call on heavenly forces. Because whether you're religious or not, it's undeniable that in the mid-17th century, these villages, indeed the whole world, lay in the grip of powerful cosmic forces. A period of global cooling historians and climate scientists refer to as the Little Ice Age. During this period, which some historians place from 1300 to 1850, global temperatures dropped an average of 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius, causing massive climatic shifts. Agricultural losses led to widespread famine and disease outbreaks, hunger encouraged rebellion, and people groups entered mass migrations. The results of this occasionally read as apocalyptic. Birds dropped dead from the sky, and hailstorms pounded down whole fields of wheat. It ruined both the medieval wine industry in southern England and the centuries-old practice of raising orange groves in China. Not to mention, it became a key factor in multiple historical events, from Napoleon's invasion of Russia, to the Manchu takeover of China, to European witch hunts, and the failure of the Norse colonies in Greenland. But before we get to any of that, we do need to make a few things clear. First of all, we should understand that the Little Ice Age is a theory. Granted, a theory with a lot of evidence, but there is no full consensus among historians or climatologists about how to define or explain this period. For example, there's still debate around when the Little Ice Age began. Some historians mark out a fairly broad period, beginning around 1300, while others suggest that the real Little Ice Age didn't start until the 16th century. For what it's worth, we're going to go with the former, more just for the sake of giving a complete picture. But even more contentious is why it occurred a question that hasn't been definitively answered. In fact, this is one of the hottest topics among specialists in this field, with differing interpretations of data, or methods of data collection, frequently coming under fire. Of course, that data comes from a range of sources. These include core samples from Arctic ice and seafloor sediment, as well as layers of volcanic ash, and even tree rings. <laughs> yeah! See, tree rings grow thicker in warmer years than they do in cold ones. Then, of course, there are the historical chronicles, tax and crop yield records, and even astronomical observations. Plus, diaries and letters can also play a role in identifying extreme weather events. And from all of these data points, a picture of the period has emerged, along with hypotheses of why it happened. But at the core of all of these theories is a mind-blowing truth, one that's easy to forget in our modern technological age. Every historical event, in every time and place, from the discovery of fire, to Caesar's assassination, to World War II, to the release of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, all occurred on a geologically active sphere of rock with a molten core encased in an envelope of changing atmosphere revolving and wobbling on its axis as it orbited a radioactive star. Literally all of our history has been subject to natural forces so powerful that in the past we either attributed them to gods, or thought they themselves were gods. And those factors have varied over time, from how far the Earth was from the Sun, to its tilt, to the composition of its atmosphere. It's a thing we inherently understand but don't always think about when we discuss, say, crop failures in medieval Europe. 
but we should, because the Earth's climate is not static. It changes naturally due to a host of factors. Most theories about the Little Ice Age, for example, have to do at least in part with the radioactive output of the sun. You see, the sun's output is not constant either, and even a reduction of 0.5% could lead to that 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius of cooling. This is especially cited as the cause of the coldest periods of the crisis from 1645 to 1715, when observable sunspots became much rarer than normal. This stretch, known as the Maunder Minimum, may be responsible for the cooling as a whole or simply exacerbated a process already in motion. Others suggest the tilt of the Earth changed, as it sometimes does. And yet another theory centers around thermohaline circulation, sometimes called the oceanic conveyor belt. When functioning normally, surface salt water is warmed by the sun in the tropics and carried north by the Gulf Stream winds. However, as it approaches cold northern climates and cools, it becomes denser and sinks beneath the warmer salt water into the ocean basin. After centuries of being pushed along these currents, it upwells back into the southern ocean or north pacific to start the cycle again. Thermohaline circulation carries heat, making places like Britain and the east coast of the U.S. warmer than they'd otherwise be. But it's also dependent on a balance of temperature and salinity, the saltiness of the water. So, if a particularly warm period melts northern glaciers and dumps a bunch of fresh water into the cycle, which can't sink because even frigid fresh water is less dense than warm salt water, this can disrupt or even stop the circulation and cause prevailing winds to become bitterly cold. And it just so happens that a warmer era, the medieval warm period, preceded the Little Ice Age. Other researchers point out that this period saw high volcanic action, with five eruptions per century on the level of the 1883 Krakatoa eruption. When that large a volcano blows, it throws sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere, where it bonds with water to become sulfuric acid. This then absorbs and reflects solar radiation, meaning less reaches the Earth's surface. And of course, the Little Ice Age could have been caused by more than one of these, with each compounding the other. Which may be what happened in 1300, when the climate suddenly shifted. For four centuries, the North Atlantic had experienced the medieval warm period, where global average temperatures were about a degree cooler than today. The result was a blossoming. Bumper harvests expanded the European population, melting sea ice allowed the Norse to settle Greenland and Iceland, and the first major era of cathedral building commenced. Life was still hard for the population, who were largely subsistence farmers, but there were fewer famines. However, by 1303, it was clear things were changing. The Baltic froze, and bizarre weather plagued northwestern Europe. The temperature was not just getting colder, mind you, but more erratic. For much like our current-day man-made climate crisis, a cooling climate could also trigger extreme weather events like drought, flood, hail, or terrible storms. And in 1315, it started to rain. Not the expected rains, mind you, but a deluge. It flattened wheat stalks and turned fields to mud. It washed away salt deposits so meat couldn't be stored, and it continued like that for five years. For Europe was about to experience the Great Famine of 1315, where crop yields would not recover in some places until 1322, where bread became so scarce that at one point the King of England could not find any for purchase, and where whole villages disappeared, and families sold or killed children to save resources. It's a terrible story, but also one of adaptation and resilience. And it's one that's important for us to know. Because under current policies, we're expecting to see 2.5 to 3 degrees Celsius of warming by the end of this century, and there are expensive lessons to learn. For in the Swiss Alps, those villages have recently changed their pact with God. As of 2010, they're no longer praying for the glaciers to recede, but rather to stop melting. That's the future of our story, however. In 1315, it is still raining, and the Black Death is waiting in the wings. But you, my history-loving friend, do not have to, because the second episode of our Little Ice Age series is live right now, a whole week early and ad-free over on Nebula. And we get into a ton of stuff, like the destruction of the Norse settlements in Greenland, the infamous disappearance of the Roanoke colony, and how the Great Famine of 1315 gave just enough of a push to help dethrone Edward II. Nebula, of course, is the independent, creator-owned and operated streaming service that we are very proud to be a part of for just a ton of reasons, with tons of videos from our ever-growing roster of 180 plus of your favorite creators on the internet? Dang! When we joined, it was like 90-something. Actually, when I wrote the script, those numbers weren't filled in, so I didn't see them before. That's pretty cool. 
In fact, a recent addition to Nebula that I've just been devouring lately is Climate Town, a phenomenal channel that was once best described by Jason from Not Just Bikes, another great channel by the way, as, and I quote, a low-rent John Oliver, but for climate change. In all seriousness though, Raleigh's content is whip smart and just the perfect spoonful of sugar to help this very important medicine go down. They're all great watches, definitely check them out. And if you don't have access to Nebula yet, not to worry. You can sign up right now by using our link in the description to get a huge discount on Nebula, which works out to be around $2.50 a month when you sign up for an annual plan. And real talk, this is just an excellent way to help support our channels because we receive a portion of that money not just when you sign up, but for as long as you stay subscribed, which has just been a wonderful boon. Thank you so much for that. So click right here to check out Nebula for yourself or right here for another of our videos on the YouTube machine. Probably has ads though. The biggest bean thanks to Ahmed Ziad Turk, Angelo Valenciana, Arcalite Games, Dominic Valenciana, Izzy Coin, Joseph Blame, Kuya Koy, and Michael Hoggett for being our legendary patrons.